Well, good morning, everyone. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Hey, say amen. I said, are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Say amen. Is the only way for me. It's a narrow road that leads to life, but I want to be on it. What about you? It's a narrow road, but the mercy is wide. You should get on your promise.
cornerstone, our chief cornerstone. No other foundation can we build upon. Not philosophy. Build your church, 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 build your church
God, today we acknowledge that we stand before a holy God. And Lord, we are holy only because you are holy. And God, today we want to surrender our hearts to you, God, and ask you to help us. God, I ask you to speak to us, God, that you would challenge us with your word. God, that you would change us with your word. Yes, God. God, we know, according to the Holy Scripture, that your word goes out and it never returns Yes, void. God, it accomplishes the purpose that it was intended for. God, today, let your word be powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, as the Scriptures tell us. God, be with your messenger today. Put your anointing fresh and new over him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you so much. <clears throat> we appreciate you. You guys can um, <clears throat> give it up for Billy and the band and the singers one time. We, uh, we appreciate you guys being here today. You know, uh, days like today, you know, I try to figure out like what, you know, God, what's on the agenda, you know, because of everything that happened with Hunter and Hunter going to heaven so quickly at 20 years old. And, you know, me, I'm just so kind of an emotional dude. I don't know if y'all know that, and I'm just kind of an emotional kind of cat. And so, uh, you know, some people, uh, I mean, they see this preaching deal as just a job. Like for me, it's just my life, and I don't know how to be anywhere else. Like, you know, they tell you, like, when you go to school, like, you're not supposed to cry when you go to people's house. Like, I don't know how to do all that. You know, when somebody hurts, I don't have any words. I'm just, you know, I'm just, like, crying. And, you know, they're thinking, which, which one's the preacher, man? Like, is there somebody here? But, you know, I just, uh, I just try to show up and just try to be Jesus with skin on. Just try to be his hands and feet and just think, like, I just want to be like Jesus. And today... So I processed last night thinking about what, you know, what am I going to do? Like, you know, do we do a prayer time? Do we do a praise time? And, you know, the Lord kind of, you know, gave me the agenda, told me what, it, what he wanted to do today. And, and uh, again, I'm just, I'm just a delivery boy. I just try to deliver it. And so um, today I come to you just real kind of emotional, um, you know, on the inside and not thinking real clearly because my mind's really cluttered because of a lot of things, you know, with Judge Mouse and everything going on. And, so I just want to be honest with you today, so just kind of encourage this preacher along in this message today. And number two, I want to cut the message in two. I've, you know, I've already, I cut the message in two. Some of you think, dude, man, you preach for 45 minutes. You cut it in two. I've been an hour and a half. And so I know I, I tell some people I'm cutting the message in two. They just fall out laughing like, man, you know. I, but <clears throat> but I, do, I do feel like God wants me to say this word to you today, and I hope you'll receive it. And it, it may not be like, you know, just spot on, just like, okay, man, you know, that was rough, man, him getting through it. But wh whatever comes out, just hear my words and don't worry about the presentation. Just hear the words of the message because it's from God and he wants you to hear this for some reason. And so I said all that to say we're on the Sunday before Judgment House. We're going into that like, God, what's on the agenda? We're rolling through this opportunity to get ready for Judgment House. So today I'd like to try my best to preach a message, share a message with you entitled, God uses ordinary people to be world changers. God uses ordinary people to be world changers. <clears throat> when I was a student pastor, some of my greatest and fondest memories of being a student pastor is going to World Changers. Now, World Changers is a mission trip for uh, students, for teenagers. It's a co-ed mission trip where we can't take teenagers and we take them into poverty-stricken areas to rebuild homes and restore hearts and tell them about Jesus Christ. Guys, I went when I was just a very young man. I got a picture of my very first World Changers right here. I don't know if you can pick me out, I, I give you a hint, it's the only dude with red on. And so I, I, was, I was a young youth leader, man, just a young youth leader. And to God be the glory, you know, it's Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, I led that little boy to faith in Jesus Christ. To God be the glory. Man, in 1991, I went to World Changers, y'all, just as a group leader. Like, like, I heard about this thing. It was brand new. I'm down on it, man. I'm, I'm, I'm fired up. I'm passionate about Jesus Christ. But I went to World Changers really to help students make a difference. And I went to World Changers really to change people's worlds. But listen, let me tell you what happened. My world got rocked. 
It, it changed my life. World changers changed my life because I realized that God could use me. God could use simple, ordinary, everyday me to be a world changer. So much so that for 25 years, uh, over 25 years of my life, I didn't have a chance to count them all, but over 25 years of my life, I went to World Changer. Some 30-something projects, sometimes I did two a year, to go into poverty-stricken areas to tell people about Jesus Christ. Man, some of the worst houses I've ever been on, roofing nasty, some of the hardest day labor I've ever seen with teenagers on the roof. Changed my life. We had this little song, you can be a world changer, shining the light to those in danger, sharing the love of the Lord and Savior. You can be a world changer. I still get goosebumps today when I hear that song. It's like when you hear Rocky and you think, man, this is it. And some of you in the room, many of you in the room, I've carried you to world changers. You've been part of that process. All over the world, teenagers, thousands of teenagers, I've had the opportunity to be involved in their life, hundreds and hundreds of adults. But it rocked my world. And my takeaway for you today is that God wants to use you and will use you too to be a world changer if you'll let him. That's the message today. If nothing else comes out right, you can say, what did dude talk about today? He just talked about I can be a world changer. You can be a world changer every day, all day long, every day, if you'll let God change your world. And no doubt, guys, there's not been a greater need in our lifetime than to be a world changer than today. I mean, look around, watch TV, see all the losses and the pain and the drugs and the alcohol and people's lives being wrecked. See all the people that are lost and dying and going to hell. Take a look. I know I'm a little loud. You may want to juice it down a little bit. I don't want to blow y'all out of here. I, I can see y'all screeching a little bit. I may want to take that sound down just a tad. I just want you to get the message today. I just want you to receive it today. I, I, if you were here a few weeks ago, I shared my heart about, like, you know, there's 7.8 billion people in the world. Remember this? And 2.3 billion are Christians. So if you take those numbers and you break it down, it means, listen, this is, this is shocking. 100,000 people would die every day without faith in Jesus Christ. Does that sink in? Like I'm talking about, if you take the numbers of people that die, people that say they're Christian, people that aren't Christians, 100,000 people die every day and go to a devil's hell without faith in Jesus Christ. Martin Luther said these words right here. Listen, listen, listen. What good is it? What good would it be if Jesus Christ died 1,000 times if nobody's going to tell anybody? What good would it be? What good would it be if Jesus Christ died 1,000 times if the followers of Jesus Christ is not going to tell anybody? We got a holy huddle. We got a holy huddle happening. We're singing kumbaya. We love it up in here. But we're not going to take the mission of the word of God seriously. What good is it? That's what Martin Luther, Martin Luther said. This morning, I've already run out of time. Let me see what time I got. I got about 15 now. I want to give you three characteristics of a world changer. Three characteristics. You got a pen, write these down. They're going to be good. You're going to take it home. I wish I had a long time to preach this whole message because it just smoke, spoke to me and smoked me. Number one, write this down. If you're a student, listen to me. I want to tell you I love you. I want to tell you I thought about Hunter yesterday. I thought about the last time I saw him at a wedding probably two years ago or maybe less. <clears throat> but I want to tell you I love you and God's got a plan for your life. He's got a plan for your life. And I don't know what that had to do with what I'm preaching on, but I just want to say I love you and I care about you and I want the best for you. And God wants to use you in the world. He wants you to use you to make a difference. Three characteristics of a world changer. I'm going to write this down. You must accept the call. Write this. Accept the call. You must accept the call. <clears throat> 
the call to be a world changer is not a sacred experience for a select few. Listen to this, listen. The call to be a world changer is not a sacred call for a select few. The call to be a world changer was included when you were called to follow Jesus Christ. If you got a copy of God's Word, look over here with me at Matthew chapter 4. And I want to show you just one verse in Matthew chapter 4. Here's what the Word says. Jesus said, come follow me, Jesus said. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Here's what that means, ladies and gentlemen. Look, look right up here at me. I want you to get this. Listen. When you accepted Jesus Christ, a few weeks ago, I had people in the audience raise their hand to say if they knew Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. Listen, listen. And most everybody in the room, man, like, dude, I know Jesus. Listen, I want to, I'm sharing the scripture with you. I'm sharing the scripture with you. Here's what the word says. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you also accepted a call to missions. You also accepted a call to advance the gospel. You also accepted a call to be a world changer. That's what the word says. It says that Jesus said to follow is to fish. Come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That's what the word says. If, you're, if your Christian life does not in some way through the local church, personally, privately, bring people to faith in Jesus Christ, you are not functioning, listen, as a follower of Jesus Christ. That stings a little bit. That's true. Everyone, listen, everyone is not called to a full-time Christian vocation like pastor, whatever on staff. But every Christian is called to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Remember what Martin Luther said? I just said it. What good would it be if Jesus Christ died 1,000 times if nobody's going to tell him? But every follower of Jesus Christ has the responsibility to share Jesus with a lost and dying way. There's all kind of ways. Personally, privately, as a church, we work together. I think I'm still loud. There's still grimacing out here a little bit. I'm sorry, I can take it down just a little bit more. I'm sorry. I apologize. I want you to understand that every believer has a call on their life to be a world changer. Number two, write this down. Not only you must accept your call, you must accept your capabilities. When we study the Word of God, we discover, listen ladies and gentlemen, we discover that God's plan for reaching the world was to use ordinary, everyday people. Ordinary, everyday people. L look at Jesus' life, y'all. So understand this. So if you're a Christian, uh, I just want you to get this today. If you are a Christian, if you are a Christian, when you got saved, you were called not only just to be saved and get to heaven, but you were called to tell other people about Jesus Christ so they too can get to heaven. So you got a call on your life. Number two, I want you to see you got to acknowledge your capabilities. We study the Word of God. We see that God used ordinary, everyday people. When Jesus began his ministry, he tw chose 12 fishermen. I see Mickey over here, fishermen. He chose 12 fishermen, tax collectors. I'm talking about at that day and time, I mean, the, the, the fishermen, man, they were smelly. I mean, they were unschooled. Jesus didn't go out and pick out some guys from seminary that had PhDs and doctors. He's like, it's like Jesus was always choosing the wrong people. It's crazy. Jesus' plan for shaking up the world and bringing people to knowledge of the gospel was to use ordinary, everyday people just like me and you. He started with the disciples when he chose them. And then in Acts chapter 6, if you've got a Bible, you can flip over there. Acts chapter 6, 
We, we see the, the progression of the gospel getting out. He, he chose these apostles, and he, he, they, they were with Jesus, and they saw him. They saw him resurrect. They, they saw him person. He gave them the commission in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. It says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, and Judea, and the uttermost parts of the earth. He gave them a commission to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. In Acts chapter 6, the disciples are still hunkered down, y'all, in Jerusalem until Acts chapter 6. They're still hunkered down. They're still in the city. They're singing Kumbaya. They're seeing a lot of people come to faith in Jesus Christ, but they hadn't left the city until Acts chapter 6. Mark's an incredible point. In the middle of Acts chapter 6, we find another ordinary dude up in here. We find another ordinary dude whose name was Stephen. He's just an ordinary guy. He wasn't a preacher. He wasn't a teacher. He was just an ordinary guy. We find him right here in Scripture. You can read all about him in these three chapters, Acts 6, Acts 7, Acts 8. And we find Stephen in this passage of Scripture. And Stephen, he's is being selected. He's a man of faith. He's a man uh, under the intru- influence of the Holy Spirit of God. And the disciples got bogged down because they're trying to take care of all the widows. You know this story. And so they came up with this plan, said, choose seven men among you so that they can wait on the widows, they can serve tables, while we can continue to, man, advance the gospel and preach the word and lead the church. So the first person they chose was this guy named Steve, ordinary dude. I'm talking about ordinary, I mean, just Stephen, I'm talking about he's just waiting tables. He's helping people. He's a servant. And he did his job so good, people begin to notice. They begin to notice, like, okay, here's Stephen, man. And, and people started getting saved. I mean, people said, this guy is for real. They started accepting Christ. They started becoming followers of Jesus Christ, ordinary Stephen. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 7, you can read this for yourself. I don't have time to roll through it. But Acts chapter 7, they begin to accuse him, and he preached this incredible message. I'm talking about dude laid it on the line. They cornered him. He's leading people to faith in Christ. There's a big uproar. He preaches this incredible message. You can read Acts chapter 7. The longest recorded sermon in the book of Acts is not by a preacher. It's by a layman just like you and me, just like you guys. A layman. Acts chapter 7. Dude lays it on the line so much. That causes riot. They get so mad. And if you got a, a copy of God's Word, I'm going to read this right here and show you something that's pretty powerful. Acts chapter 7 and verse 54. Here's what the Word of God says. It says, when they heard this, they heard this message, they heard everything that's going on. This is a huge turning point, ladies and gentlemen, in the gospel to be spread around the world. I'm talking about the ultimate world changer, life changer, Stephen, in this moment. I'm talking about this guy was a layman, an ordinary dude. I'm talking about the gospel is still in Jerusalem. He's laying it on the line. He preached this message. He laid it out. And so these people, they got so mad. Here's what happened. When they heard this, they were furious. They gnashed their teeth at him. They gritted their teeth at dude. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelled. Have you ever been around anybody like that? That They don't want to hear about the things of God. They don't want to hear you talk about Jesus. They, they Really, they just covered their ears, yelled at the top of their voices, and they all rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes, listen, at the feet of a young man named who Saul, who became Paul. In 59, here's what it says. While they were stoning him, they stoned him. Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, this is the first Christian martyr, Stephen. He's just a layman. He's a witness. He got saved. He didn't get over it. He understood when he accepted Jesus Christ, it was not just a a call to follow Jesus, but it was a call to be a world changer. It said when they, while they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this, this sin against them. He, have you ever heard that before? Huh? He, he, don't hold this against them that they are killing me. But when he said this, he fell asleep. 
and Saul. In your Bible, you see Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 8, but this isn't in the original Greek. This is all together. This is a one together story right here. And so there's no break between 7 and 8 in the original. And here's what it says. And when he said this, he fell asleep. He died. They stoned him to death. And Saul, Paul, became later Paul after accepting Christ, was there giving approval to his death. That's a stunning fact. He was giving approval to Saul's, I mean, to Stephen's death. It says, on that day, a great persecution, listen to this, listen. A great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. Listen to this, this is interesting. And all except the apostles were scattered. The apostles were still in Jerusalem. Jesus had told them to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Uh, Persecution broke out. They're all hunkered down in Jerusalem. And all the apostles, all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen, mourned him deeply, mourned for him deeply. But Saul began to destroy the church. Here's old Paul. Look at him, man. He's destroying the church, going house to house, dragging off men and women and putting them into prison. Here's verse 4. Here's what I want to show you today. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Now look right here at me. Listen. I want you to get this. Stephen, because of his death, these ordinary, everyday people just like you begin to take the message of Jesus Christ. It said the word of Jesus Christ was scattered. If you study the scripture, and I don't have time to show you all this, but the very first church that's planted, Acts chapter 11, it says some brothers, some brothers, it's some guys that got together, ordinary people. It didn't even list their name, y'all. It didn't even give their name. He's just ordinary guys just like us. And in fact, you'll see this progression in the book of Acts. Some people just got together, and some brothers, followers of Jesus Christ that got saved and didn't get over it, became a follower of Jesus Christ and started fishing, telling other people. They believed what they heard, that people that lived, if they did not receive Christ, they would go to hell. They began to share the gospel in such a way, they began to plant churches all over the place. God uses ordinary, everyday people. Last week, I talked about Jesus Christ's greatest and favorite preachers. Remember who that was? Starts with a J. It ends with on the Baptist. Anybody help me out? John the Baptist. Jesus' favorite preacher was a guy named John the Baptist. Remember I told you the whole story last week. Man, it's a powerful, powerful story how, how he had some doubts. In, in, in Matthew chapter 11, look at this. I just want to show you this. I, I'm, I'm running out of time. Matthew chapter 11, here's what it says. Matthew 11, 11, here, here's what Jesus said. He said, I'll tell you the truth. Not that Jesus ever lied, but he said, I'll tell you the truth. I want to emphasize this. Among those born of a woman, there has not risen any one greater than John the Baptist. Listen, listen, look up here. Look, look. Jesus said, nobody ever been born from a woman greater than John the Baptist that's pretty high resume you know what I'm talking about but you need to read the rest of our series what it says yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is the greatest he who is least in the greatest let me tell you what that means it means that God uses ordinary everyday people the other day I was driving down a certain road I saw this guy with his hair all matted up. He had paisley pants on, paisley pants. They were skin tight, paisley pants, matted up hair, backpack. Dude looked like he hadn't shaved and showered. Listen, if you're in the room today and you feel like the least in society, maybe because of sin in your past, maybe because of some struggle or you're unschooled, uneducated, you are number one on the resume. This preacher got up one time, and this may offend some people. He got up one time and he said, I'd like to have all the valedictorians go ahead and stand to your feet. Please don't stand here, valedictorian. Salutatorians. He said, if you play quarterback on the football team, if you if you was in the top 10% of your class, he said, if you were a president of this club, he named all the people. 
And then he said this right here. I got good news for you. God can still use you, but you're not his first choice. God chose the least in the kingdom to advance the gospel. And today, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done in your past, God wants to use you in this world. I mean, the apostle Paul, you're talking about the least. I'm talking about, we just read about it, Saul. He, he's persecuting the church, dragging people off. I'm talking about putting them in prison, going against his faith until he met faith in Jesus Christ. Yet what did God do in Paul's life? He let him, read, he let him write over two-thirds of the New Testament. No matter what you do in your life, God wants to use you. This is the message today. I don't know how you're getting it and how it's coming out. This is just what's in the well and it's coming out. God uses ordinary, everyday people to change the world. He wants you to be a world changer. No matter what's happened in your past. In fact, listen, God made everybody in this room good at something. Truth. It's what the Bible says. God made you good at something. And God wants you to do whatever you're good at to the, for, the, for the best, for the glory of God. Strategically. For the mission of God. He made you for a purpose. I don't know what you're good at. Maybe you're good at building. Maybe you're good at managing. Maybe you're good at, at cooking food. Maybe, maybe you're good at serving. Maybe you're good at leading. But whatever you've been given good at, God wants you to use it for his glory and strategically to bring people to faith in Jesus Christ. God don't mess up. He didn't give you a job and give you a life. You know, when you think about eternity and light of eternity, and I deal with death so much. I think about it all the time. I ran into this sweet, incredible lady at Piggly Wiggly. It was a divine appointment, and I couldn't find what I was looking for on Friday, and I ran into her. And she was my English teacher that I cheated in college and stole her test. Her name's Miss Mashburn. She's a great godly lady. She exercised so much grace when I went to her and told her, listen, I cheated on every test. They put me on probation, kicked me out of Mid-South Bible College. She was so gracious to me. You, I'm telling you, listen, you came today to hear a sinner preach, man, I'm talking about. Man, I messed up. She was so gracious and kind to me. So much so she, she just loved me. She, Jennifer would sing an ensemble. She was crazy about us and I built her kids, uh, uh, her, her children, um, uh, uh, Chuck, like a dining room table and them old dining room tables with wood and all that. I built a child's version of that. She still got it, 92 years old. I walked into her, ran into her. I couldn't find what I was looking for. I ran into her. I thought, man, I was frustrated because I'm thinking I wasted trip and then ran into her, 92 years old. <clears throat> I said, Miss Master, it's so good to see you. She said, she called my name Mike. Man, been 30 years like Mike. I still got the coat rack you made me when you were in school, man. Old coat rack. My husband, his hats hang on it. And I said, how's things going? She said, I lost my husband. I lost my son with cancer. She said, I'm 92, and I don't know why God left me here. She, I said, I done had hip replacement surgery. Had, I think she had another surgery on her neck. I think she's had like three or four heart attacks. She had cancer. Still kicking. Man, it was at a final point, man. I'm, you know, right there in Piggly Wiggly by the baskets, people everywhere. Man, I pulled her in my arms. She's a short lady. I pulled her. I pray to God's blessing over, man, just a Holy Ghost moment in that Piggly Wiggly. Not because I'm great, but God's great. I thought about that, 92 years old, think about 120 years old. We focus so much on quantity rather than quality, quality. I don't know how long you're gonna live. I don't know how long you're gonna live, I'm, I'm gonna live, but I, I'm just telling you today that God made you to be you and you don't have to be nobody else. You don't have to compare yourself to nobody else. You don't have to be nobody else. And today, if you feel like a reject, I preached about it a few weeks ago. Remember David? He was overlooked. He's out in the field, ladies and gentlemen. He's overlooked. And today, some of y'all need to be encouraged and know God's not done with you yet. 
And God somehow wants to use your story for his glory. Whatever you've been through, it's not an accident or incident or whatever you've been through in your life. God wants to take whatever happened. And he wants to use that for his glory. He wants to use that to promote himself. And he wants to take that. You're good at something. Everybody in the room is good at something. And God wants to use whatever you're good at for his glory and for his mission to advance the kingdom. Last point, and I'm out of here. You got to activate your commitment. You got to activate your commitment. Stephen, listen, dude, this guy was all in. He wasn't halfway in, he was all in. He wasn't... He wasn't a, a Sunday morning Christian. He wasn't just like, I'm going to church today. Dude was not a halfway Christian. He was all the way in. I'm talking about he was fully committed to the cause of Christ. Like, he gets it. Like, some Christians, they get it. Like, dude, I understand. And, and God's called me to be on mission with you no matter where I go, whatever I do, I'm on mission. Shine the light of Jesus, share the love of Jesus. I'm on a mission with people I come in contact with. Every person I come in contact with, divine appointment, Miss Mashburn, every appointment, every appointment, divine appointment. Stephen was all the way in. <laughs> he wasn't halfway committed. He, wa he wasn't a person that was like, okay, dude, I'm just coming on Sunday morning, and I'm, I'm good. It, it kind of reminds me of that chicken and that pig. They was walking down the road together. And they look over and they saw these kids that were poor. And they hadn't looked like they hadn't eaten in a long time. And the chicken said, man, I got a good idea, bro. Why don't we provide, why don't we provide these little children with an egg and bacon breakfast? <laughs> Old pig walking along there, he strutting along. He thought about it for a minute. He said, well, for you, you're just giving a contribution. You're just dropping an egg, bro. For me, I got to be fully committed. I got to give my life. Jesus Christ wants his followers to give their life. I'm not asking you today to give your life, to die for Jesus. I'm asking you to live for Jesus every day. Can you imagine? Jesus took 12 people and turned the world upside down. Can you imagine what God would do with Olive Branch, Mississippi, if, every, if all of us just got it? Like, dude, we got it, man. I'm all in. I'm all in. You know, some people, listen, 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 listen. I got to get out of here. Listen. Some people... Say, I need to hear a voice to know that I'm called. You waiting on your liver to quiver. I know God's got something for me. I'm just waiting on the voice. He's giving you a verse in the Word of God. You can stop looking for, listening for a voice. He'll give you a verse. He said the follow is the fish. There's nothing more important. Listen, just like Hunter today. Like one day you're going to die. You're going to stand before a holy God, and I promise you, the things of this world, you're going to think that we're important, it ain't going to mean nothing. I showed you that rope, man, I can't help but think about it. Take that little black tape, put on that rope, stretch that rope out hundreds and hundreds of feet. This is earth, and that's eternity. We only here for a short time. And as a lot of the songs say, we think we're here for a good time. But God wants us to make a difference for the kingdom. God wants you to be fully committed. Activate your commitment. Some of you in this room need to let go and let God. You need to be saved, accept Jesus Christ. If you don't know Christ, I'm going to give you the opportunity to come to know Christ. If you do know Christ, I give you the opportunity to join this church, to go all in, not just be a casual. Some of you need to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ. I personally believe the local church is the hope for the world according to the scripture. It's when we come together and we serve and we work and everybody's important, all of us are doing what we do. Man, we are a vehicle. We are a life-changing machine. 
You know what I hope in my lifetime? I don't know what the future holds for bird loving. I hope I get to go on a lot more world changer trips. I hope I get to go around the world. In fact, I've been praying about doing a mission trip in springtime for the church here. Go make a difference. But you don't have to leave Olive Branch to be a world changer. You be a world changer right where God puts you, put you, and you bloom where you're planted, and you trust God. I believe judging my house is a vehicle God uses to bring people to faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to do some research by Wednesday night. I don't know how many miles it would be for another church to do judge my house. I'm all about having revivals or whatever. Billy Graham, but I can't think of any ministry that brings as many people to faith in Jesus Christ. And you have the opportunity to participate and tell people about Christ. If you hadn't signed up for Judgment House, you say, well, Burr, you didn't put my name down. We didn't get your card. Why would we leave anybody out? We didn't get your card. I've got three people looking at them and say, well, they didn't put me in anywhere. That's because we didn't receive your card. You may have thought you turned it in, but we didn't get it. And if you're here today and you're saying, well, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not going to participate, I, I can't beg you enough to participate in Judging My House. One day when you stand before God and he says, man, look at all those people over there. Because of your dedication to Judging My House, look at all them people that got saved. There's three things that last forever. Look, 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 look. God, the Bible, and souls. That's it. Your clothes, your house, your money not going to last I'm just preaching the word I'm preaching the word of God as best I know how Matthew chapter 4 verse 19 soak on that one Acts chapter 6, 6, 7, 8 read that story to blow the doors off your mind God used ordinary everyday people a layman, he rocked the doggone world man, shook the world up he wants to use you too I'm closing, I'm out I'm reminded of that little boy that came to church and his parents didn't come so he went to Sunday school and his teacher took him to church with her and she sat beside him and first time he had been at church he saw the big organ, saw the piano, saw the choir saw everything, he was amazed halfway through the service he saw these guys start passing these silver plates he leaned over to his teacher and said what's that? She says, this is what we give Jesus. He thought for a minute, I don't, I don't have any money. I don't have anything. As the plate began to go by, a little boy got up and asked the usher to come over. The usher was real hesitant. And the little boy said, sir, could you put that plate on the floor? And the usher put the plate on the floor and the little boy stepped inside of it. He said, Jesus, I don't have anything to give you but myself. And he gave the greatest gift that day of everybody in the church. Today, I'm asking you to accept your call to acknowledge your capabilities. Why was Stephen so powerful? Because he was full of the Holy Spirit of God. He was under the control of the Holy Spirit of God. It was just always manifest in love and kindness. I mean, read the scripture. That was his secret. And today you might feel defeated. You might, you might feel like I'm, I'm lost and lonely. You got the Holy Spirit of God going to give you everything you need and empower you to do whatever he's called you to do. Hey, today, I'm kind of a weird person, in case you don't know. And I've got these rubber bands all across here. Sometimes you might see a rubber band on my wrist. Don't ever ask me what that's for. Because I'm a weird dude. So I put rubber bands on my wrist. Because it's something God's teaching me in my walk. Teaching me what, what, what he said to me in a quiet time, what he said. And I put rubber bands on my wrist like some people go, dude, man, he must have been throwing papers and put a rubber band on his wrist and forgot to take it off. And sometimes if I'm working on things like, man, we know I do, I remind myself what God's saying to me. Today, 
passing out rubber bands. Pass out rubber bands for you to put on. What's it going to remind me of, Burr? I'm asking you today to fully commit yourself to Judgment House. Come down here and go, dude, look, you know what? Put the plate down. God, I'm committing my life to be used in Judgment House. I'm giving up my attitude. I'm giving up my demands. Help me be a team person. Help me to be a prayer warrior. Help me to show the love of Jesus Christ. So I'm asking you to come down. We went to Judgment House every year. You know what we did? It's pretty incredible. We would have the people, and some of y'all remember this. They would say on Sunday night, man, we want you to pick a tool. Pick a tool out of your belt, bro. Get one of your tools and bring everybody a hammer. Bring your hammer down to the altar. And you commit that hammer to Jesus Christ. Like, God, use this hammer, dude, to nail some shingles on. I'm asking you today to bring yourself down here. Stand here. God, I give you myself. And I pray, God, that you would use me. Just a simple prayer. Simple prayer, God. I give you my all. I'm all in. Use me for the kingdom. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for dying on the cross to pay for our sins, Jesus. But God, we're thankful today that we don't just get to go to heaven, God, but we get to take heaven to a lost and dying world. I pray, God, over this audience today, I pray, God, the power of your Holy Spirit would speak to them and remind us that you called us to be world changers and you want and will use us each and every day of our life if we'll let you. So, God, we commit this time. We pray, God, that you would bless Judgment House. We pray that lost people would come to know you. We pray against the devil. We command the enemy to get out of here in the name of Jesus Christ. We plead the blood over this church. And God, we ask you to move in a powerful way. I want to ask everybody to stand to their feet. Here's what I'd like to ask you to do. I'm going to stand on this step right here. If you're in the house and you don't know Jesus and you'd like to be sure you're going to heaven, you can come to me. If you feel led to come and say, I need to join the church, man, I'm here for you. You say, Burr, I don't know about this rubber band deal. Man, try it. It might change your life. I'm asking everybody in the room to give your life totally, to activate your commitment. It's one thing to talk about being saved. Say you're a Christian. It's another to live it out. I'm going to ask you today to come take this band, put it on your wrist, be reminded to pray for judgment house, be reminded you're fully committing yourself to Jesus Christ. As Miss Ellen and Billy play, I want to ask you to come. You can just come and stand there for a minute, say a little prayer, and get your rubber band. Will you come? I'm asking everybody to come. In the quiet in the stillness I know that you are God In the secret of your presence I know there I am restored When you call new day again I'll choose there is no one else for me none but Jesus crucified to set me Now I live to bring in praise In the chaos and confusion I know you're sovereign still In 
the moment of my weakness you give me grace to do your will and when you call I won't delay and this my song through all my days there is no one else for me none but Jesus crucified to set me free now I live to bring him praise there is no one else for me none but Jesus crucified to set me Anybody else? Two or three minutes. Come on. Who, who wants to come? Anybody? Anybody else? Hey, Michael, come on up here. Hey, this is Michael Howard, and he comes today to, man, he got saved about right there on that block right there, man. To God be the glory, man. We give it up for you, man. I'm proud of you, bro. He gave his life to Jesus Christ, and man, Michael, greatest decision you ever make in your life, man. And he's got a plan for your life. Man, somewhere or another, I don't know how this happened, dude. Like, me and you got, like, when you were born, I was born, or whatever, in this day and time, 1150, and don't tell the people what time it is, but, dude, man, you know what? Like, dude, man, God orchestrated your life with the power of the Holy Spirit to bring you to this point to save your soul so you didn't have to go to hell. And, man, we just thank God, man, that we get to be part of it, man. So we, we applaud you, brother. he got a plan. Hey, better days ahead with Jesus, bro, all right? Hey, man, Michael, will you go right over there and hang out on that wall right there, right over there, that, that other guy right over there, and uh, you can go by and give him a handshake. Hey, here's what I need to do. Hey, we've got 50 people that signed up. Don't sneak out of here because God saw your hand. If you sneak out of here, God, get them. God, God, if they sneak out and they did not, uh, if they raise their hand and they leave and they raise their hand, Lord, I pray that you would convict them, Lord, all the way home. Help them get a stomach virus. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Hey, so here's what we need to do. We need to take up all the chairs. We got to put the tables out. We got uh, sandwiches in the back. I think I said Jersey Mike, but I think I lied. It's not Jersey Mike. I couldn't pull it up at the right time, but it's the other place down the road. What's it called? Firehouse. Yeah, Firehouse. There you go. So my bad. So I didn't mean to tell you that. And so I want to encourage you to do that. Also, Fall Festival, uh, we need you to sign up in the back. Please, we need you to sign up for Fall Festival. It's on the back end of that. What's that? 
Yeah, so we need a lot of people to sign up. So please sign up today. We need a lot of people to sign up. Go by and sign up. We got Judge Brown to sign up. Hey, take up chairs, set up tables. We got sandwiches, 50 people. God bless. See you Wednesday night. Get out of here. <laughs>